Today, we're going to take a look at the Beavers. And I mean college football. It's coming up right now. Hey everybody, welcome to Elite Athletes TV. I'm Mike Pulaski, 11-year pro quarterback and quarterbacks coach here at EliteAthletesTV.com. If you haven't checked out the site yet, get there, EliteAthletesTV.com. Today, we're going to do a preview of the Cal-Oregon State Beavers football game coming up on Saturday. Before we get started, if you haven't done so yet, if you love football, make sure you subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, get notified every time we have new stuff coming out. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to take a look at Cal and Oregon State, and leave me a comment down below. This Pac-12 season has been interesting, so I'd love to hear your thoughts, what you're thinking out there about the Pac-12 season, about college football season, anything, everything's allowed. Also, share this video out, family, teammates, friends, family, did I say that twice? Anybody who likes college football content, football content, X's and O's, learning the game, share it out. We're trying to help as many young athletes as we can. Right now, we're talking Beavs, Bears, Saturday, Corvallis, with the voice of the Oregon State Beavers. Well, joining me now is one of the greats in the Pac-12. He has been the voice of the Beavs for 22 years now, and he, is, he knows everything about Oregon State sports. Mike Parker, welcome to Elite Athletes TV. I appreciate you joining me here today. Great to be with you, Mike, and we sure had a great time visiting with you yesterday. I appreciate the knowledge, the X's and O's stuff. So it sounds like your site's filled with that. I'm going to have to go and try to learn a few things. If you say I know something about Oregon State, maybe a little bit about the history, but what Brian Lindgren and Tim Tebesar are up to, I'll have to defer to you on that. Well, I appreciate that. The X's <laughs> and O's, you want it, you got it. Come check yeah. out the site. Everybody at home, remember, subscribe, Elite Athletes TV, get all the inside football knowledge. You can get it there. Let's talk about this upcoming game with Cal and Oregon State. Uh, an interesting matchup. Both teams, Cal obviously got affected, lost their first game with the COVID, um, and then were able to play kind of in a makeshift schoolyard ball UCLA game last week. I don't know how much Oregon State gets from that video. I know Oregon State had a COVID scare too. Just talk a little bit about the weirdness of this season so far. It, Mike, it's, it's unlike any other, of course, and – the fact that Oregon State, I mean, six of the teams in the league have been affected and have had some sort of cancellation or change. Oregon State's been able, has been scheduled for two and been able to get two in. But you're right, even for the Beavers into last Friday, there was a charter plane watch going on. Would the Beavers get on the charter? Would they fly to Boeing Field in Seattle and get off the plane and go to the hotel? Yes, yes, yes. They did all of those things, but because of the one positive test leading to the quarantine of four players who will remain in quarantine for the weekend. There was some doubt cast over whether or not the Beavers and Huskies would play. And I know you were supposed to play the Huskies early. It, it, I don't know what to say about it, Mike. Just I think if, if Cal arrives and the Beavers play at 1230 Saturday, that's all good just to get a game in. I think we will. Everything's been good and clean from Oregon State's end this week. And I understand you have all your players back out of quarantine you can get some real practices in now but we take nothing for granted i'll just be glad when they kick it off yeah that's a big one getting all your you know a whole d-line group right a whole position group out how do you practice that way but the bears you know they showed up it wasn't a great game for them but they ended up at least putting a product on the field and getting some reps so supposedly they've had great practice this week we're going to see what's coming up the beeves stand at zero and two but a couple of games lost by 10 to Washington State early on, maybe a little sloppy. But that Washington game, I will go on record and say you guys got jobbed on that spot. I mean, you have that first down inside the five, we're going in, going to win that game, and they take it away from, from you with a bad spot. I, I was disappointed by that. What did that feel like as a, as, as a part it, of the program? Yeah, it was tough to call, Mike. You know, we were like you guys were. You you were in the Memorial Stadium calling the game from the Rose Bowl. We were at Reeser Stadium calling the game from Seattle and relied on what FS1 provided. And we said, I said, give, you know, give to Jefferson. He picks up the first down. It'll be first and goal coming up. And then right. we were stunned to see that, well, well, they're they're gonna measure this, I guess, for some reason. And then he's short, you know, on third down. So now he has inches to go on fourth down. Jefferson clearly got way more than inches. He got a half yard or closer to a yard. And they measure again and he's short again. It was astonishing to us. And I'm glad it wasn't just a homer job. We all see these things, obviously, Mike, you know. I mean, we see with our hearts and we, we are biased 
there's no objectivity per se, but I was glad to see that the national writers started weighing in almost immediately on Twitter. I saw Pete Thamel, I saw Dennis Dodd, I saw Stuart Mandel, I saw John Wilner, who does the best job of anyone of covering the league in your area. They all just immediately essentially said, what was that? You know, that's a first down if ever there was one. Scott Van Pelt did two minutes of it on his show later about what a, a bad spot that was. Now, you say the Beavers could have gone, you know, we could have gone on to win the game, arguably. It would have been interesting to see. I think we would have scored a touchdown, go up 28-24 with 12, 13 minutes to play. The Huskies may very well have come back and won. But I think it would have been interesting to see how it played out, and I have no explanation there are some things that just remain inexplicable forever, and that's going to be one of them. Well, we had the Corvallis minute when Cal played up there when I was at Cal. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. there's, there's little, it just goes around. Eventually, karma comes back around, I guess. But I, I just thought the Beavs got jobbed on that one. So I feel for you guys. Let's Thank talk you. about Jonathan Smith. He's in his third year now as head coach. I love it when alums come back and coach mm-hmm. their program. So when he got that job, I thought it was fantastic. Talk to me where the program's at right now under Coach Smith. You know, Mike, the thing that I, I've been saying, and, and maybe we're all in the end of this close to our programs, are going to have to say, I'm not sure what 2020, how many games we're going to get in. And people ask me, well, how many games do you think the Beavers need to win to call it a successful season in year three for Jonathan? And I, I'm not viewing this year really that way. I, I think the Beavers are going to win some games in 2020. And I'm not trying to sell Jonathan or the team or anything short. But for me, whatever happens this year, the trajectory that he has, the program, the direction he has it going in, the staff that he's hired and retained, uh, to have everybody back on the staff this year, and the, the way they're going about, the, the, way, the method, you know, that the Beavers have used when they've had successful eras, they've had to go find a Jamar Jefferson that nobody else was really recruiting. They've got, they've got to find guys out of the junior college ranks that are that are maybe being under-recruited or not noticed. And Jonathan knows that, having gone to the Fiesta Bowl with Dennis Erickson. Times have changed, we know, in, in, in how many people you can get in. I'm not sure that same Fiesta Bowl team could, could work in today's world. But he does know how to win in Corvallis. He's done it as a player at the highest level. He knows the territory and the culture. So I don't really care what the final record is this year. I love what he's doing with the program. As Scott Barnes, our AD, said, he's our guy. He's been a beaver, you know, for for so much of his life. And I like the way he's recruiting and coaching these guys up and developing players. So, you know, I I think the program's in great hands now with Jonathan and a tremendous staff, which includes a guy you know very well and Jim Mahalchik, one of the best in the craft at offensive line. The coordinators are solid. Uh, I I think the Beavers' future is bright no matter what happens this year. Yeah, Jimmy is great with the offensive line. He has been since I knew him when he was down here at Cal. Uh, really good coach, which leads to my next question. It's a natural tie-in. Jamar Jefferson, you talked about it, a little bit about him. He's got 254 yards in two games. Yeah. He, I mean, he's running the ball well. You guys are moving people off the offensive line. What's special about him? You know, he, the, the thing, is, I was a little surprised when we were getting ready to play Washington. Jimmy Lake, when asked about Jamar Lake, said, he's a big one. Well, he stands 5'10 in 217 pounds. Now, to me, that's not on one level a definition of big. When I think of a big running back at Oregon State, Steven Jackson comes to mind. Now, there's a guy. He's a big one, yeah. Yeah, combining speed and power and the description, he's a big one, works. But Jamar plays big. He he runs big. And he's fat. We haven't yet seen – a lot of breakaway speed opportunities, but he's gone to work on that too. He's strong. He's big. He's durable uh, vision, his ability to, to follow his blocks in the zone schemes. I, I think like Evanson Bernard used to be Mike Riley said, Evanson Bernard who hurt Cal a couple of times over the years, Riley said Bernard was the best zone runner he ever had, but Jonathan Smith who knew Bernard and knows Evanson well thinks that Jamar is the perfect runner in Mahalchik's blocking scheme and the way the Beavers choose to run the ball. He's special. And 21-23 carries the first two games. I remember Stephen toted it against you guys once about 35 times. Bernard had 42 carries in the 2005 game in Berkeley against you. I don't know if Jamar is going to be able to do that, but I think they want to feed it to him even more than what he's gotten so far. 
Well, he's the perfect combination of speed and patience, right? So he yeah. sees the hole, he hits the hole, and he, and he follows his blocking. So just really nice, very smooth back there, but he runs hard for a little guy. Look at it this way. He towers over Broussard from Colorado. So, you know, he's big in that <laughs> yeah, regard. That's Tell right. me about your quarterback, Tristan Jebbia. You know, Tristan – did not have a good game at Washington. You know, we just, you know, that that's clear. The the tape would say that. The numbers certainly say it. 11 of 24 and 85 yards. And he missed some things early. I'm not sure what, you know, Jonathan has told me, he and Coach Lindgren said there were opportunities against the Huskies. You know, you don't get that many opportunities. You don't get guys open against that secondary very often. They had a few things early that he didn't see, he didn't hit. Jimmy's always done a great job of disguising things and making it difficult on quarterbacks. Tristan's uh, sample size in terms of playing a lot of games is small. You know, he hasn't played uh, a lot. This is the first year since 2016 where he's been the number one quarterback in an offense. He's been waiting a long time for the opportunity. He's the ultimate gym rat. You know, that's a compliment when Jonathan Smith calls him a gym rat. Tristan is. So I suspect that he'll take it to heart all the things he needs to do to get better this week. I still think he has a great future in this offense this year and for a couple of more years hereafter. Yeah, and for definition, for those at home, Jim Rat, a guy who puts in the time, right. it works out, lifts, does the film work, all that. It's a definite yeah. compliment when it comes to football. We have a little family tie going on this week. We've got Luke Musgrave out there, one of Jebbia's mm -hmm. main targets. Obviously, Billy Musgrave, our offensive coordinator here, Talk about Musgrave and how they're trying to use him on the offensive side of the ball for the Beavs. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, Doug, Doug Musgrave, whom you know, and is Luke's father uh, and Bill's brother, uh, Doug said Cal. Cal really liked Luke Musgrave. We were just talking off the air about this. but And, and Luke liked Justin and that entire staff. So it was pretty close. I think it came down to Cal and Oregon State, essentially. And had Luke chosen Cal, he'd be playing for his uncle, you know, this weekend in Corvallis. As it is, the Beavers are delighted to have him. Very smart, athletic kid, but still young in the game of football. He was a late blooming guy his senior year. And Ben, he'd been more of a lacrosse guy and a speed ski racer in the mountains, in the Cascades in Oregon, winning championships doing that. And Doug said all of that movement required in speed in speed, I believe me, I don't know anything about speed skiing. I barely can get up on a pair of cross country <laughs> skis, Mike. But I, he, Doug said that that helped him with his lateral movement, with a sense of vision and, and all of that. And I think he's going to be a huge fixture in this offense as this year goes along. I think the sky's the limit for him as a guy still learning the game of football, still learning his craft, but is an outstanding athlete. He's been featured some. Uh, Tristan missed him a couple of times in Seattle with some passes slightly behind him. But I think that Luke's going to grow into being able to help his quarterback out even more and catch some of those things, be a 6'6 guy in the red zone that they're missing. Isaiah Hodgins caught 13 touchdowns last year and was an outstanding target for Jake Luton in the red zone. I think Musgrave is going to end up being that kind of guy this year and as his career develops. The Beavers are, are thrilled to have him. And as teams play more man coverage, obviously your tight end becomes a weapon because you get your mismatches on that front. You have five receivers with over six catches each in just two games. Yeah. Uh, the main, the number one pass catcher, Javon Bradford, talk about him and talk about the rest of the group. It's been more by committee. I referenced Isaiah. And Isaiah, as you know, was an outstanding uh, Pac-12 receiver, 86 balls last year and the 13 touchdowns. And Part of the reason the Beavers led the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone, 33 out of 39 conversions to touchdowns. And this year, had they spotted the ball properly in Seattle, uh, they would have been perfect again. And they'd be eight for eight right now, but they didn't get the spot. But th the thing that I think right now that Tristan, I wouldn't say is struggling with, but I don't know how you felt about it and who your main go-to guys were at Cal and in the NFL is it important, Mike, maybe you can answer this for me, to have a guy? Right now it's a committee with Bradford and, and Colby Taylor and Zariah Beeson, a promising freshman, and Musgrave and all of that. But Jake Luton always seemed to have Isaiah Hodgins on his radar. I knew that Isaiah would be open. He could get him the ball, and Isaiah would go up and get it. We're still kind of looking for that guy. Bradford's probably the most versatile receiver 
But how important is it for a quarterback to have a, quote, guy? I always loved having three guys. So, you know, and each guy does something different. If you have a guy that goes up and gets it, at Cal, I had Sean Dawkins. You just mm – -hmm. I knew if I was going to throw that go ball, either he was going to get it or nobody else would. I had Brian mm -hmm. Treggs, who ended up as yeah. Cal's all-time leading receiver when we were done – and I knew that he was going to break your ankles with his routes. And so I could count on him to get open. I had Mike Caldwell, who would find open space in the middle of the field. Plus, Brent Woodall is my tight end. So mm -hmm. having a bunch of guys is actually better. You just have to gel into yeah. kind of that range where you know what everybody does and where you can utilize them. We're, the Beavers haven't taken many, as the film would indicate, many downfield shots yet. And I think that's in the, it's in the playbook. Tristan's been pressured a little bit. He's been a little skitterish at times in the pocket, but we haven't seen that show up much yet. And I know, you know, again, there are not going to be many opportunities against Cal's defense along those lines. But right now, I still think the receiving core, there's a bunch of them, but I, I don't feel quite yet they've all hit their stride just in terms of working on the same page with Tristan but they're getting there and there's some, some there's some balance in the receiving room in terms of route running, but we haven't seen a, a speed guy yet. We haven't seen the, the deep shots down the field that I know Jonathan and Brian Lindgren would like to take once in a while. We haven't seen it yet. Well, so let's talk about the defensive side of the ball. You have to find that rhythm on offense. Cal obviously didn't find that rhythm versus UCLA. UCLA said, we're going to pack the box. We dare you to run the football or beat us with the pass one or the other. And they weren't able to do either in that game. Now, there's reasons for it. But I imagine with the linebacker crew that you have at Oregon State, you guys are going to do the same thing. Pack that box and say, I dare you to beat us with the pass. Talk about your linebacker crew. Ta start with Avery Roberts. Love him. 22 total tackles on the season. Now, the, the inside linebackers, the two guys, Avery Roberts and Omar Spates, are, they're good. They're, they're guys. And there's been a lot of missed tackling, as you know, uh, I think you told us there were 17 in your game against UCLA. The Beavers had a lot in the opener and even early against Washington, against Washington State. There was a lot of missed tackling. But even with that missed tackling going on, that doesn't happen to Avery Roberts and Omar right. Spates. They're like a Tony Gwynn, the rest of his soul, walking up to the plate in mid-December. He'll hit a line drive. You know, I mean, these guys tackle you. They get you down. The Roberts and Spates are a tremendous pair of inside linebacker. So I think that is where the defense starts. But you saw in the game last year, we haven't seen it all yet this year. And that's Hamaker Rashid Jr., who's been a little limited. He had three sacks against Modster last year in Berkeley. Riley Sharp coming off the edge had three sacks in Berkeley, nine sacks total for the Beavers last year in that upset win. And we haven't seen anything like that yet from the outside linebackers. We actually saw some improvement up front in the interior defensive line play at Washington. There were guys starting to Evan Bennett, a redshirt freshman, making some plays inside James Rawls, a junior college transfer, Simon Sandberg, a young man out of Sweden began to show up a little bit. Isaac Hodgins is a good veteran player, but for the Beaver defense to get where it needs to go, those outside linebackers, the edge rushers are going to have to kind of try to return to the form they did last. They showed last year. So is Sweden becoming the new Australia as a hotbed for college football recruiting now? <laughs> well, uh, you know, Sandberg is, a, is a, a find, a great find. I don't know how many other players. I haven't studied every roster. Are there a few more? Is, our, is Sandberg the only one that you know of? Well, I remember when the first Australian came in to punt, and now it seems yeah. like every college program has an Australian punter. So right. I've seen Germany and now Sweden. So apparently Europe <laughs> is starting to really develop their football programs. It was great. Good. I went over and coached a, a football clinic over in Italy last year, and I was going to go back this year, if not for COVID. So hmm. they love it over there. They're playing the game and they've got some great athletes. So it, it now, have, you, have we seen a player from Italy yet in our conference ever? Oh yeah. Um, Giorgio Tavecchio from Cal. Sorry. Oh, Giorgio yeah. Tavecchio from Cal, obviously a kicker from Italy. So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Italy's covered. Germany's covered. Sweden's covered. <laughs> we just got to get the rest of the EU and we're golden. Right. That's good. So uh, one more thing, Tim Tibisar obviously coached under Justin Wilcox at Wisconsin, yeah. 2016. J-Dub was the uh, defensive coordinator. Tim was there coaching outside linebackers. Oregon State's defense, oddly enough, when you watch film looks a lot like that Wisconsin defense, a lot like Cal's defense. And so Talk about what Tibisar is doing with that defense and how much, how, how close they are to each other. Yeah, I think they're very similar. And I love 
tip us off. Uh, you know, the jump the Beavers took, I mean, what, you saw what happened in 18. In 18, the, when Cal last came up here, the final score was 49 to 7. Cal just destroyed the Beavers. And there were some other games that were similar in nature. Ohio State scored 77 in the horseshoe. But from one year to the next, in the second year last year, the Beavers took, it couldn't get much worse, but they took a tremendous step forward with Tim Tibisar's direction. Uh, I think, again, on the defensive side, there's some good good coaches, too. Trent Bray with the inside linebackers, Tibisar with the outside backers and coordinating it, are they're tremendous. Lenny Sue, Noah, Lenny Sue Noah on the defensive front does a nice job. And, you know, Blue Adams, I think, has helped improve the secondary a good deal. So, yeah, I think the defenses are similar in philosophy and approach. And Tim's going to get – I mean, he, he did such a great job last year that – the development of the players has been phenomenal. I mean, a lot of the guys they inherited from Gary Anderson have become pretty good football players, and they're going to continue to be. I, I love Tim. I love his approach. We're glad to have him, and you know, we'll see what unfolds with the similar schemes uh, come Saturday, but I look forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward to this game. Both teams obviously need these wins. You have so yeah. few games, need to get the wins. As you said, this season I, I put an asterisk by it. I think right. you want your wins, but you also want to develop your players and keep everybody safe. And if you get that done, then it's going to be a, a, a good season for your program. It's a big game, clearly, for both in, in terms of – well, I'm not trying to be dismissive of wins and losses. I, you know, obviously, you're trying to win as many as you can. If the Beavers don't get this one at home, then suddenly you know, you're looking at the opportunities, Oregon the following week, then traveling to Stanford and Utah. That's tough. So I know the Beavers are all in to try to get their first win. And I think they feel pretty good about the way they finish the Washington game defensively. And if Jebbia can play, just have a, you know, a more workmanlike, steadier performance behind the running game of Jamar Jefferson, I think it gives the Beavers a chance, just like last year, to be in this thing. And I know your team, you throw – if ever I've seen a game that you just dismiss as, you know, what, what relevance does the UCLA game have? I'm sure you guys feel like you're ready to, to just essentially put it out of mind and come back and be the team you know you can be. So I expect an excellent game Saturday. Yeah, I am looking forward to it. You have a great call. I appreciate you coming on with us here at Elite Athletes TV. Everybody should tune into this game. It's going to be a fantastic, interesting game with yeah. a couple teams that are trying to find themselves on both sides right. of the ball. So appreciate you coming on, Mike. Have a great call. Thank you, Mike. Great to, great to be on with you, and thanks for coming on our show, too. I hope we can do it again. Thank you, Mike. A lot of depth there. Mike knows the Oregon State program. Been around there for 22 years calling games, both football and basketball. You should check him out. He's really good. I enjoy his stuff. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell. We'll be having college football updates, breakdowns, analysis. We're talking X's and O's. You can learn the game. We're talking about scheme. So if you're a young athlete, we'll be teaching you about the game as football, as well as telling you what's going on in college football. Give me a thumbs up. If you enjoyed that, and if you want more from around the Pac-12, from around college football, and leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. Finally, please remember, share this video out. We're trying to help young athletes. Sharing it out means we can help more young athletes. Appreciate you watching today. Just a little college football preview, Cal, Oregon State. Hopefully we improve some of your football IQ, football skills, and we will talk to you again soon.